That's great. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, look at that. It's fantastic. Yeah. Go all right. I love it. That's good. Thank you. Way better. So, but you guys look so much cleaner and clearer than me. It's because you have like a different, your light is a little harsher, maybe. I have a very soft light on. And um, I, anyway, don't worry about it, Richard. It's a nice, clear image now. Okay. Yeah. So, you 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 guys now is this a collaboration uh your conversation or an appearance because rich you have a new photo book right a new photo essay book yeah let's see it do you have a copy there show it to our the masses yeah year zero look at that beautiful look at that that, they, a lot of work went into that. What's the publisher on that? What's that? Who's the publisher? It's a small publisher out of Baton Rouge, uh, Louisiana, called Art Voices. He used to have a, uh, his name's Terrence Smith. He had a uh, magazine called Art Voices, and then he transitioned into book publishing. He's got about 15, 20 titles, and this is uh, his latest one. Fantastic. And I have my copy of uh, Year Zero back there on the table. You can see Look, it. It's, uh, you got that place. Mine Just is, um, oh, wait, I don't have one. Not yet, but I, I'm gonna, <laughs> I will take care of that. Richard will take you, help you take care of that. He'll point you in a good direction. Can I get one it cost? Um, <laughs> anyway, you, I'm You glad. guys have met before, right, Adam? You guys uh, go back. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, you know, like I, what's the word? I mean, I was kind of like nagging Richard. I don't even remember how. I have to put some thought into it. Richard, do you remember this at all? Like you're doing the podcast. It was over the phone, but I try to remember how it all even came about, how I got your your contact information, how I reached out to you. I'm trying to, I'm struggling to remember that, but uh, it's a while ago now. And then the following fall, is when you showed the short, your short film. Your, I'm guessing it's one of your more recent, if not the most, I don't know, uh, at the Woodstock Film Festival, and we met there in person. Okay, I have no memory of it at all. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, I do well, remember. I do remember Woodstock Film Festival. Um, I remember showing the short there. Um, yeah, that's good. That's honest, and that's all we want here is pure, 100 percent honest. You know, uh, uh, in intercourse here. That's all. So it's all right. It wasn't. Excuse me. Excuse me? What? We, we talked a long time though. And no, I, I heard the word. I heard. A, I heard a bad word. <laughs> yeah. Eng Let me change that over to uh, engagement. How's that? Is that more palatable? Okay, I like that. All right, man. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, as being an enormous fan of yours, uh, I I don't remember. Again, I can't remember how I I got. Maybe I ran into you. I don't have any memory of how it happened, but I got your you on the phone. We recorded it. I kind of like literally was re holding a recorder to the phone because at the time you were even, if possible, less tech, like you know, centric, whatever. And uh, but you were a really game, and you you talked, and we we chatted about life. You were in a moment. Maybe this will help trigger your memory. Is you were kind of going through a period of wanting to get back to New York City, and we were trying to figure out how to make all that happen. Okay, that hasn't changed at all. All right. Let's continue the conversation. <laughs> so tell me more interestingly how you and Nick, Nick, you know, how you guys connected. Yeah. Um, it's a small gallery right around the corner from me. It's called These Days. It's got a Stephen Ziegler and wife Jody Ziegler. And um, it took over an old, what kind of building? It was like a... Uh, industrial building that was kind of deserted and broken down and he fixed it up and he he lives on the top floor and he has a gallery on the second floor a gallery um bookstore and i don't know seven years ago eight years ago um downtown no matter what you have heard about la is kind of a silicultural wasteland 
Um, and when they opened, I, I went up because it's right in my neighborhood and take photography for photo books. So I'm a big fan, of course, big fan of photography, big fan of photo books. When I was there, they had amazing, amazing choice and they had a beautiful gallery. And uh, they had, they've had nothing but great shows uh, for the last seven years or so. And, uh, and it's just right around the corner. And, and then one... One day, Stephen said, hey, man, you got to come see this show. This photographer, filmmaker um, is showing tonight. I think you'll, uh, the two will get along. And um, so I went, and it was Nick's show, and we we hit it off immediately. And I loved his photography. I, he had some films there. He said he's been a big fan of mine for years. And we just started talking, and then I told him about this book I was doing, and I had this idea of making a kind of a companion film. And um, he liked the idea of doing a companion film. I had all these ideas to, and I gave him a, uh, like a couple pages of these ideas and um, Nick uh, read, read them all and then just ignored them all and started to do a, um, uh, a film about me and a film about the book. And uh, it's been a little, uh, um, it's been a little, uh, Strange having all this focus on me. I keep telling uh, Nick, he's like, stop focusing on me so much. And then he's like, well, you're, you're the subject of the fucking film. I, if I don't sub, uh, um, if I don't focus on you, we're not gonna have a film. So I kind of uh, he twists my arm and uh, I'm going to get away. over your self conscious. It's not so much self conscious as self. Yeah. I, I have a hard time thinking of myself being important enough to be the subject of a film, but Nick keeps saying I am, and other people kind of agree, so who am I to argue? That's right. I, I have to get on board with that that uh, group of folks. <laughs> I know, me too. I, your... I, I think I should as well as, as a director. Um, I mean, yeah, Richard was at the, was at the show when Earthquake Weather, because we did earthquake weather uh, a few months ago we did had a great conversation adam um and i think i was just about moving in to have the show at that i can't remember was it did i had had i already had had the photography that's within the book the analog photography show and i i can't remember but richard was at that show and uh, on the opening night and i'm standing there and i'm a bit nervous you know because you just like you know it's the release of a novel it's very personal of course um, and um you know there's a photo there's an art world element to it and richard walked in and uh it put me it put me at ease because i think what was so great about that was you know earthquake weather is very much about or based on a time in my life when i was um finding all kinds of incredible film music artwork um you know th those things became my life and you you cannot as a young kid in film school not study stranger than paradise it's it's a film that changed a lot of things and it it, it i think much like cassavetti's shadows it helped kind of these a whole generation of people say fuck i can make a film you know maybe not as good as the film that they made out there but it it gave me a lot of um a I lot see. of a lot of juice like you saw that and it's all these brilliant one shots and it just and they got to a feature film in these in these incredible one shots of this very very cool little story and um so seeing richard there was like this kind of incredible thing for me at that night you know, on that night in particular um and we just started talking and i said i said god you should put in a film together you should really be in it you know like read this book and why don't we have a conversation and start talking and I, and i learned that that night that richard um is a photographer. I didn't. I didn't know that. I also didn't know that Richard um, 
was a drummer. He's the original drummer of Sonic Youth, um, you know, which is a band I've, I've loved since I was probably 15 years old. And somehow I, I missed that. And also Conk, which is like a great part of the New York kind of downtown post-punk, that whole legendary scene. And I didn't know that there was a, a musical connection. Um, and so we hit it off and, and he, he, he said, Hey, would you like to shoot something? And I wasn't planning on really shooting anything until I got into my next film. And I just looked at Richard and I'm like, of course you're Richard Edson. Of course, I'm going to shoot something with you. Let's figure out how to, let's figure out how to go to work. Um, and we started shooting, uh, about four or five months ago with the idea of exploring Richard's pandemic chapter of his life um, while also looking at his career kind of side, side by side um, as a documentary. And the shooting has just been um, incredible because, you know, we all have these pandemic stories, but what's remarkable is that Richard was out in the pandemic like every day shooting pictures and writing what he was um, feeling and going through. And there's just thousands upon thousands of images and, uh, and uh, you know, it's very kind of like Robert Frank in the, a war correspondent at times and then also someone that really just kind of is very sensitively shooting um, still lives. Um, there's a, uh, you know, during the pandemic in Los Angeles um, and it's quite remarkable piece of work. And we, yeah, I, I'll, I'll hand it over to Richard, but that's kind of the setup of how we got shooting. And I wasn't expecting to shoot a documentary, but we've, we've, we've gotten into it and it's going really well. Richard, were you at the time shooting with the, as with the pandemic as a subject or as a backdrop of the of whatever you were shooting, very intentionally? And also, what do you what what do you work with? What is what equipment do you work with? Um, yeah, I, I, it was it was. I've been doing a lot of uh, I guess street photography for years and years, and uh, you know, guys like. Uh, Robert Frank, uh, Lee Friedlander, Gary Winogrand, uh, this uh, Dutch photographer, Ed van der Elskin, the uh, Japanese photographer, Dedo Moriyama. And I also like to ride my bike. And LA is not the best um, street photography town because so much of LA is in the car. I was just back in New York and I spent every single day out five, six hours at a time, just wandering around. And you go from neighborhood to neighborhood to neighborhood and there's no end to it. I mean, yeah. I I took, you know, I was in Manhattan mostly and I just scratched the surface in 10 days. I just scratched the surface in, in uh, New York. And I've... I've lived in New York. I grew up in New York. I've, I've, I've been shooting in New York for years and years, but it's it's just amazing in, in, in terms of street photography. I guess the other towns would be London and uh, Paris, maybe Tokyo, of course. But um, and Los Angeles isn't a great street photography town because it's not a lot of street life. Um, and um, so... I I like the bike. I like to um, um, shoot. And for the three four weeks before COVID, I kind of had a sense something was coming down. I I kept in I kept very close to the news. I like to read the news, and I heard about it in the middle of December that there was a uh, virus in Wuhan, China, and there was no known vaccine for it. And you just I don't know if you guys remember or if you were following it. It was just, it was just this little percolating start. And it just kept, it just kept moving and moving and moving. And then you had the uh, the first death, I think was on January 1st, which was in China. And then they they had the, the Wuhan was was uh, was shut down. And then 
what was that? The the princess something, the the American uh, um, um, um um what was it? The uh, the ship, the uh, cruise ship was was stuck in the Yokohama um, harbor, and I I found that people weren't really paying attention. But then most people don't pay pay much attention to anything outside their life. And for some reason, I like to read about this stuff, and I was paying attention. I had a sense. Well, we had uh, Italy was shut down, right, in the middle of uh, February. Yeah, because of Milan, because of the travel between China and Milan. for Yeah, years. and this was a country of 60 million people were shut down, and people in America were still like, oh, whatever, it's going to – they'll figure it out. They'll figure it out. Nobody had a sense that this – this was coming down, and I kind of had a sense only that I was. I spent the first twelve to fourteen days walking around the uh, streets of downtown Los Angeles, just just sensing this impending. I don't want to say doom, but something was happening, and then doom once, huh? definitely, definitely doom adjacent. It was definitely doomish. Doomish, uh, uh, um, doom adjacent. Yeah, doom adjacent. Doom adjacent. Pretty. But doom is such a. I know. It's much a thought. Yeah, yeah. It was. It's a very dramatic word. But there was a sense. Sense that it wasn't really until the lockdown happened or the week before that people people were like, "What the fuck? I gotta get. I gotta get all the toilet paper." <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But um. Once it started, I was like, no, this is this is a global event of such magnitude and such proportion that I kind of owed it to myself to give myself something to do. And I owed it to my friends who weren't going out. And I owed it to, I mean, this may sound a little pretentious, but I felt like I owed it to the people of the future who would think and like, what the fuck was it like? And And I didn't. I didn't have any, I, I, you know, it was a very subjective, personal kind of diary journey. Now, it, it was more a journal because I wasn't, I didn't want to focus on myself all the time or most of the time. So I was focused on what was going on in the world and in, in terms of what was happening in the news and trying to integrate that into my life and how I was going to communicate this global event from a very personal, singular point of view. And uh, so it was very intentional um, and, and very personal. And I just found it, it, it gave me a purpose and a meaning and, a, and something to do every day. And I got to say, I had a great time. Um, you know, I, 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 yeah. so, many, so, many, so many people I know had a, had a miserable um, lockdown uh, pandemic. And I was like, you know, and then the George Floyd protest hit, and that happened right outside my my doors. I I I live in downtown L.A., two blocks from the uh, three blocks from police headquarters, four blocks from City Hall, where it was kind of the epicenter. So I was, uh, and then the uh, stop the steal and the election. So it was a very eventful year, as, as you gentlemen know. And it was, uh, I was in a very fortuitous situation and I was very motivated to to keep it up and I don't know if you remember this in our last conversation Adam um, but I think part of the reason that I connected with Richard on this was we were talking about how the pandemic had you know afforded so many people this ability to um, do the things that they had wanted to to do like I was able to finish this novel and I went out and got to explore the city that was virtually empty while we retracing my life that connected to this story. So, and I was able to shoot these shots of these places that were part of my life as if it were a ghost town. And in Los Angeles, that's fairly impossible thing right. to do um, unless there's a, a pandemic the likes of which we've never seen before that's what, how i was able to do it and richard in many ways you know um w did his own version of what i was you know you know what what i had done so we had this kind of uh 
camaraderie over this kind of exploration, of, you know, through the city, um, taking these pictures. The, I think the difference being was I was looking at my own life 20 years ago, trying to find that stuff. And Richard was in the, he was in the now, he was in the moment. And I don't know if you felt that way, Richard, but I, I remember that as part of our early conversations when we... Uh, when well, we I do remember just feeling uh, um, acknowledging that we shared the same feeling, that, that our pandemics were productive and useful and to some degree actually fun. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I'd say that. I'd agree. I don't know about you had <laughs> like a weird, a no, weird. It was, well, it was a little bit, <laughs> but yeah, nonetheless, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I, I did have a similar um, experience, and I made some major. Sh I had some, you know, drama and uh, some uh, um, loss, but then also I took some, you know, major risks, and they paid off pretty well. And I also reconnected with an artistic side of myself that I had been neglecting for a long time. So I. I definitely relate to what you guys were talking about uh, on a very you know personal level so you know i think that if you were able to due to whatever circumstances you were you were having at the time able to connect to some part of yourself that maybe you were neglecting or you know whatever took a time the time and the space that you that you, you know this this otherwise horrible experience afforded you you really could have uh, you know, a great, it could have, you could have a good time. If you don't die, <laughs> it's good. Yeah. Uh, tell me, just, just, um, I think built into the book itself was that it just wasn't so intensely related to me and my feelings and my, right. my thoughts. It was, but I was, was reflecting upon the event. And yeah. I, and I also felt it was an invitation to other people to also reflect on their experience of the same way we're doing right now. And I hope that is kind of built into the book. And I think I think it, it worked in that way. Nick, you think? I think so. Yeah. I mean, because that's a lot of the reason I wanted to to start working with you. And you know, Adam, we started out like the parameters were like a five, a five minute film. We're going to make a five minute film. Five minute. Uh, oh, just yeah. kind of, you know, we'll shoot a weekend and yeah. you know, we'll see what we get and we'll just put it together. Maybe, maybe, some, maybe, yeah, short. Maybe someone will show it. And then, you know, it was like, but then, well, maybe it should be an eight minute film. Let's make it an eight minute film. And then oh, in that, I it was like, we did a concert. Yeah. And I had my drum, so that kind of like, <laughs> we should talk about that. And then it turns out that every time I hang out with Richard, he tells me something completely awesome, like that he was playing um free jazz concerts at a club called Zebulon in LA. There's one in New York. Is the one in New York still there? Or it's no, they, that, they had they closed it because of the and they moved to LA. That's right. So yeah. it was a great club in in kind of the edge of Silver Lake. And um Richard had been playing like free jazz experimental jazz to nobody all through the pandemic with a with a combo that he put together so we we recreated that and we started filming that in the in the club these concerts well, that, we didn't recreate it we were going to do it anyway and i said well yeah but it kind of it shows what you yeah, were yeah. Up to, you know at the time um and uh it was you know you know Richard's uh you know not just a iconic actor he's also a incredible drummer and a musician um and and so he kind of started scoring the film we were making within the film itself if that makes sense so we were filming him scoring the film live you know he's yeah. setting the beat to his own story in a sense and so now we're up to 20 minutes and we're like okay, well, is this this enough, or maybe we should go a little further? So we're we're gonna see what happens as we as we move through it. But uh, but we're actually in real time, like you know, talking while this is a definitely a work in progress, and 
no one knows. Yeah, exactly. It's still it's still like an evolving it's an yeah. evolving pro- project. How long have we been shooting now for four months? I think at this point, kind of on and off. Remember, I was going to New York in August. Right. So we had to do it before August second or third. Right. Shot the weekend before that. So we're the August, September, October, November. Yeah. Yeah. Then we shot last month too, as well. Then we shoot two. Well, we shot the concert. We. Yeah, we I think we've shot a total of seven days and we just keep shooting <laughs> so far, kind of here and there. Uh, we even shot, we had a, um, so uh, the gallery noticed what we were up to. I think just like you noticed what we were up to. The and uh, the gallery, yeah, Steven Ziegler uh, noticed yeah. what we were up to at these days and um, put up a show on uh, last Friday night of um, presented in the, of Richard's work presented in the four by six prints that he makes at CVS because that's how he previews all of his work. And I love that it's analog and he does it, you know, as, uh, uh, you know, like the way we used to get photos because most people just take a digital and they they don't print it. It just, you know, winds up being shared yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, electronically. Yeah. And so basically the way I saw these pictures initially was Richard brought them to me and yep. slapped them down in front of me in four by six. Yeah. And I just went through them like the way that we used to look at our pictures, you know, like, uh, and that was really, really cool. And so um, we we worked on the show uh, and uh, presented everything that way, just literally the four by oh, six like yeah, yeah, on, yeah. on the wall. Um, I don't know. I started printing, doing the same thing because I, I just missed it so much and I wanted to start giving them to people like, I started going to CVS too and doing yeah. it after Richard inspired. You know, then you can also, by the way, you can get you know eye drops and uh, exactly toilet paper, whatever you need. I mean, it's, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of pluses to um, yeah. getting. Yeah. Well, here they go. I knew you were gonna, you're yeah. looking for. Yeah, yeah, I got some too. Right, right. And so here's one of which protest is this again? Is this George Floyd? That is the George Floyd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the right. first night of the when the shit came down hard um it was a riot i mean it, it was funny i showed it to uh, one person i was asking for a blurb and they called it a police what they call it a police riot and it wasn't a police riot i mean kids just went fucking crazy and a little uh, to your right maybe nick you see it a little bit to your right a little to your right oh okay. i didn't know keep going no, no, the, no. the other way Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Perfect. That's George Floyd too, as well, right? Uh, no, that was um, that was in September when Brianna Taylor, oh uh, yeah, the killers of Brianna Taylor got off. So that was, yeah, that was a scary, right? Uh, a scary one. So Richard was like a ground zero for a lot of these things that were going on, um, which I found quite amazing. And then there's like moments like this. Like that are not activist space. I don't know. Should I put some more light on the pictures or? Um, it seems mm-hmm. correct. No, I can, that's not bad. That's not bad. It's yeah, that's not... at the Disney Hall, and that's just like some vapid LA people like doing a selfie and and right right, right up against people getting married. So are those four by ten? No, these are the four by sixes. I mean four by six. Yeah. Yeah. And then like you know the National Guard. Left, to your right, to your right, to your right, to your right, to your right. Pretty intense, yeah. Really intense, yeah. And these are are these in the book? Yes. Okay. Yeah, these are all in the book. Okay. Nick is not in the book. No. I'm gonna, I showed up later. <laughs> He'll be in the. Uh, I showed up in the, in the aftermath <laughs> of all this. Um, and then the other thing that was really interesting, Adam, was as Richard and I started talking, I asked him, well, you know, like, how long have you been shooting pictures? I think that was, you know, like throughout conversation. Um, and, you know, Richard's been shooting since the 1970s, since um, New York, since he was in the uh, art scene in San Francisco. Um and he was even shooting on a lot of the iconic films that, you know, he was a part of, not all of them, but a, a lot of them. 
and we started pulling out the backstory um, of Richard's career. A lot of these pictures, some have been published. You did a film about some of your movie. I mean, you did not a film. You did a, a book about um, some yeah. of your photography. Um, but there's a lot, a lot of stuff. Like um, there's incredible pictures from Alex Cox's Walker that was all shot in Nicaragua in, what was that, 1988, 87? 88? Somewhere. Yeah, yeah, something like that. 87, 88, yeah. I mean, and, and um, these pictures are great. It's all black and white on a Olympus pen, and there's just uh, incredible shots of, you know, my hero, Joe Strummer, Alex Cox, another filmmaking hero of mine since the early, early days. Yeah. Um, you know, Ed Harris. Um, and then there's pictures from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, you know, if you'll remember, uh, Richard was sure you know, took uh, Cameron's dad's car for a full spin. Probably the first time that I saw Richard Edson on screen and that connected that the, that this guy was somebody I needed to pay attention to, and and started seeing him popping up in other movies before I got to um, Stranger Than Paradise a little bit later. Um, but and then Platoon, there's incredible pictures. Uh, um, taken on the set of Platoon uh, of um, Willem Dafoe, um, uh, Forrest Whitaker. Um, I mean, uh, I'm thinking about who else is in the film, who else is in Platoon. You know, just, uh, they're just, it. it's not like set photography. Yeah, Baldwin. And... No, I don't think a Baldwin's in that. Uh, uh, anyway. Oliver Stone. Yeah, there's Richard um, gets... in Platoon. A... This is a it's little a too. It's a self-published but it's great. Yeah, there's Willem Dafoe. What's that guy's name that's with Willem Dafoe? Um, uh, his name is all we know of him is called the Cobra. If you to see the Cobra, guy, the, the Cobra. Wow, that was his nickname. He was an assassin in the uh, uh, well, he was in the special forces in the Philippine army, but we were told that his main job was to kill people. And if you look at how dead. His eyes are compared to Willem's, you know, bright, full of life, and he was trying to imitate, but nobody can imitate that. I mean, you, and he looks like a killer, mm. and he is a killer. The claw, uh, the cobra. Oh wait, maybe it was the claw. No, it was the cobra. It, I, I mean, and you could feel, so you could feel, and so feel the darkness just being out. But they came out to check us out when we were on the set. Because we were using the uh, no, this was before the set. This was on the uh, during the uh, um, um, boot camp, so-called boot camp, and we were using the um, Philippine constabulary. Uh, anyway, there where they train, mm -hmm. and he came out. A bunch of guys came out to. Uh, that's only. That's not too long. That's about ten years after Apocalypse Now, right? That you guys were down in the Philippines. Uh... Shooting what that. was the problem with We did this in 86. Yeah, I think it was 77, 76, and 76, but it didn't come oh, out in 79. I think you're right. Yeah, 79. It came out in 79, but yeah. yeah. Amazing. Wow. And Charlie that, Sheen. Yeah, Charlie Sheen was the lead. Yeah. But it's great pictures of, of all of them that Richard took. And I just hadn't seen. Um, you know, I there is a couple shots that Hopper took on um, might have been the Sons of Katie Elder or this uh, or a movie with John Wayne with Dean Martin. What's the one with Dean Martin and John Wayne? Dean, Dean Martin plays the Mitchell. Yeah, Bravo. It's kind of like a yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. There's um, I think there's a picture of the two of them. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think Richard's work is reminiscent of um some of that. So, where it's not set photography he's finding these very interesting right. moments of the of the people themselves and that's uh yeah that, that's the that, that's, that's, that's something the that you still have copies of or stuff like that that's from uh I... yeah like there's um Amazing. there's shots from time code mike figgis's time code there uh, ferris bueller's day off just it's really really pretty that cool time code sure and it, it kind of makes it all sort of classic looking, just timeless and it's great. Adam, I don't know why you were so 
I cannot hear. I can hear Nick so well. I don't but, know, man. Uh, it's I know that I'm okay. Uh, I got it now. I got you, Adam. Oh, <laughs> what? <laughs> Just hold that like a walkie-talkie. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Richard, that's <laughs> please. Um, oh, and Richard, by the way, I just it just occurred to me. I think the last time I actually I saw you one more time because uh, Esther is also a friend of mine, and Esther Balin, of course, we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for and, reminding me. I owe her a phone call. Of, that's what I'm here for. And uh, <laughs> and I I was at a, a concert in the East Village. This is years ago, um, and I think. In my memory, you were there, which was a surprise because I knew you were in L.A., but I think you were there and you were kind of just standing in the background and I was standing there and I was a little hesitant to bother you. And it was during, of course, which was, uh, you know, Esther, with both. Esther's concert? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no was okay. it Esther's concert? Yeah. yeah, but it was with, um, what's his name? Um, the African-American, he did the Passing Strange. What's, what's you know what I'm talking about. You were there. I'm pretty sure you were at the show. It was like at this little gallery uh, performance space in the East. Oh Village. yeah, 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 yeah. It was uh, something had to do with Jean Michel. Um, yes, I think so. That's right, and she was doing that's with right. uh, yeah, the Negro yeah. problem guy. The Negro problem guy. That's right. Uh, and yeah. passing strange. Stewart. Stewart something. Stewart. That's right. Stewie. Stewie. Yeah, I had a bad experience with Stewie. I put together a band with a guy named Ernie Banks. He was not the Ernie Banks, yeah, but he was he, he was an actor, and he was also an ex-con, and he was also a um, very good chess player. Mm -hmm. And he told me he had a he he was a performer, a singer, and I had a uh, I had an in at a club in Hollywood, and I got ourselves a gig. But basically, they were all professionals. I was playing Funger, and I didn't, I wasn't quite up to their level, and they made it very, very difficult for me. Like they'd be calling, uh, they'd be calling rhythms much, much faster just to fuck with me. And really? then Ernie, and I blame it on Stu. He was not friendly to me at all. So I have a bone to pick with that guy, huh. and. Uh, and then, then Ernie tried to get a gig at their club, but X me out, which is kind of foolish because the woman who uh, owned the club was a real good friend of mine. So of course they didn't get the gig, and uh, but uh, you know, That's a I'm, I still have it out for that guy. Too. <laughs> well, I only know him, I only knew him because my ex-wife was in Passing Strange, so <laughs> I, which was on Broadway, in which Spike shot. Um, oh right, that was his show. Yeah, now he's probably a great guy. That, he made a duck Esther, says, yeah. Esther says nothing but great things about him, so I'll give him the benefit of that. Yeah, exactly. So she's up here. I'm up in the you know north of the city, but anyway, she she comes up here, and I was I had been in a I had a space you know uh, I don't know if you know the area too well, but near Bard College, I had an apartment, uh, and I, I yeah I went to Bard. Uh, what? I went to Bard. Oh, you? I went to Bard. Yeah. Well, so did I. But so I. You did. Yeah. Well, I didn't graduate, but I. Neither did I. There we go. See, so lots in town. Um, but I, she, she, I had an apartment, and not, you know, I moved up here during the pandemic, since we, that's one of the things that I did. But I, I had this place, and she, I was going to try to make it available to her because she. So we were talking a few times. We play in this group of musicians. She when she comes up. And so I've gotten to see her a bunch of times recently. And then I saw her at Steve Buscemi's new film at the Tribeca. I kept running into her. And it's been the greatest thing. Because she's a real, genuine, sweet person and very talented person, too. Yeah, yeah. Talk, about yeah. a, talk about a cool actress, too. I mean, yeah. that performance. I mean, all three of you guys in that movie. Just yeah, it's really quite an amazing, amazing film. Is it the 40th anniversary of Stranger Than Paradise? This year, coming up. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, in a way, uh, Esther and John's acting was almost kind of anti-acting. Yeah. Like they, Esther, 
Uh, you agree? I'm not even it's, sure what that means, but I know that neither of them wanted to act as it's traditionally known. And what's interesting is that because they were playing so such downbeat, unexpressive characters, it gave me all this room to play off of them. And I have a I have a more upbeat energy, so it was very easy for me to find my way in in reaction to them. So that's a good problem. I never thought it in those terms, but that that is makes a lot of sense. They stripped away as much as they could, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of um, I don't know character building maybe it was a, a more of a stripping away than a building on you know? even emotional expression yeah everything yeah yeah well it, it i had the same feeling and um, i stumbled into that film i was living in boston at the time and i went into this art cinema in boston i made i don't know nick if i told you this story or i'm sure i told you this richard but it is no, I want to hear this. It's great. I, I, I was heading into what I thought was uh, a different film. Um, I believe it was, um, who's the guy that shot all of Altman's films? Oh, God, I should know this. That's all right. Um, oh, you went to film school, Nick. Come on. Come on, man. No, I, no. I'm all right. <laughs> Put everybody on the spot. I don't, um, anyway. Let me look it up. You know, Alan, Alan Rudolph. Alan Rudolph. Uh, Alan yeah. Rudolph. So it was a Alan Rudolph movie, and I was about to. I thought I was going into that, and um, I I read the ticket stub wrong or whatever. I walked into the wrong theater. Stranger Than Paradise was already starting, had already started. So I sat down thinking I was in a different movie, and about five ten minutes in, I'm like, this doesn't even make sense. When and it was just these brief scenes, like, and then it would go black, and then it you know it would go fade, and and it would go into the next. And I'm like, what is this? And I was within. 20 25 minutes i was transfixed i was i was so swept into it i was like it, ch it literally changed my my out my view of the of the world of art of film everything it it, it changed my life uh it, it, i i just looked at it like nobody has ever made a film like this that i've seen and i had i you know in my i, I don't think i had a limited um knowledge of film but i don't know there's something about this very specific way that jim made that film that was you know blew me blew me away it really did just then i just looked for how can i see more of these films like how can i see more of this and that really opened the door i think i think it was the first film for me i saw it on videotape i think it was the first film for me that i actually smoked an entire pack of cigarettes while i was watching it in in the place i was staying at the time against your will somebody <laughs> Like <laughs> no, that, no. That, like, that, yeah, no, that, no, but I think somebody put it put it in for me. I don't think I voluntarily picked up the VHS tape at a video store. I think oh. that somebody forced me to watch it. So we sort of had a similar. Yeah, exactly. And I just no, I it was like it was like hanging out with like um people I wanted to hang out with, watching a story that I really wanted to see that I don't think had been approached in that way before i don't it was truly it was truly an original um and i just remember like just smoking like i was hanging out with my friends and i had an ashtray i mean it's not a good thing health-wise that you smoke no it's not a great, good thing health-wise but it's a good thing art-wise i think it's a good reaction to that to that movie at that time in my life i was maybe 21 at the time uh-huh I think I think it was like somewhere in there. Really? Oh well, because it was on video. Some it wasn't in the room. Yeah, I had just. I, it was a movie oh, I had. Yeah. I had missed. It was the one that I had missed. Uh, the first one I had seen was um, Night on Earth, and I kind of worked in this weird order through Jarmusch's work. Work and at that time, and that was the last. That was the last one missing. I think right before Ghost Dog came out. And um, I don't know if it was in many ways, it's my it's that's my favorite of all of uh Jarmish's films, is Stranger Than Paradise. And I like I like most of them completely unconditionally, but that one was as we can know is uh, for people that may be watching and don't know, it was originally shot, it was a short, yeah, 
but you know and then right the short what became the feature though it wasn't a case where they reshot the, the beginning right no they, they expanded the short it was first 30 minutes it ended with me giving uh esther the dress and she's taken off and and then i go back to willie's and we're sitting on the uh couch uh, after she leaves, and we're just saying nothing, drinking the beer. Now, what's interesting about that scene, we had dialogue. And I come in, and I sit down, and I forget my dialogue, what I was going to say. So I didn't say anything. <laughs> and he doesn't say anything. And that's the scene. And that's how the first part ended. And then Jim took you to the Rotterdam and the Berlin Film Festivals, and he met this guy, Otto Gruppenberger who offered to give him enough money, $120,000, to turn that, do part two and part three. And then it, I think the next scene was the poker, poker game that we win, that we win enough money to take, get us to, to Chicago. Oh, Chicago? I mean, uh, Cleveland. Cleveland, it was Cleveland. Why do I think it was Florida? I'm not sure. Because they go down, they, they go down at the end, right? If you, you go to Cleveland, we go to Florida. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. There's a great photo don't book. Correct me, I know what I know what I know how. Please don't correct me on my podcast. <laughs> there's a there's a cool book that Richard showed me that's um, from the producer, who yeah. put all wow. these Polaroids he shot along the way of making the movie into a box, and then had found them, um, and he put out this book. Thirty five years later, yeah, he yeah. forgot he keeps taking these. It's a really great over. book. I had known. You have it? Did I give it to you? Yeah, I gave you the book, we, right? Well, no, we borrowed it for we borrowed it for post production, but yeah, I, I I'll give it back. To no, you. I mean so you it's have. not in my possession <laughs> right now. It's in a it's you in have. A, I'm I'm back. <laughs> but yeah, I have you'll get it back. Don't worry. Bring it back. <laughs> yeah, I mean that 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 film is um in so many ways is just uh, uh I think like gives rise to that great thing called independent film that moves from the 80s into the 90s this it's like the i think it's the movie that opens that door to me personally of of well i think yeah i think there's a i mean i look at it as part of a couple of or two or three films that do, that do what you're saying you know maybe uh she's got a habit is another well that's another that's a very important one too yeah and uh and what's funny is uh, Spike is kind of part of your gang too, right? Like he's he's around for Stranger Than Paradise and and all that, isn't? And that you wind up like in the thing. He went. He went to uh, NYU with with Jim. I think he was a year behind, and so he was very aware of uh, of uh, of uh, Stranger Than Paradise when it came out. I think uh, she's got a have it came out the next year or a year after. And since he knew me, he just sent me a letter asking me to uh, to be in, do the right thing. But it was interesting. He wanted me to play Pino, which was the part that John Duro got. And, and I thought, oh, this is great. I get to play the mean guy, the nasty guy. The, uh, and I thought, okay, that would be a stretch for me. And that's something I really would like to try. And he, he would wanted Matt Dillon to play Vito and De Niro to play uh, Sal. Wow. And uh, De Niro, for whatever reason, said no or couldn't do it. And then he got Danny, who was, you could not have a more perfect Sal. That was perfect. No, that was perfect. So much better than Right. Danny. And then he got John Totoro. And I didn't know it was like John's a very strong actor and could not see him playing the nice guy. But Spike never told me. And he took Danny and myself and John to the set to show us the set because they had the set was in Bedford Syverson. And he, he took over a whole block. And everything happened in a movie happened on that block. And uh, he took myself and Danny and John to the set just to show it and to introduce us to each other. And at one point I, I took John aside. I'm like, John, so which part do you have? And he looked at me and like, you know, like, 
of course, it was a little bigger part. And I was like, that's how I found out that it was you know. I wonder, did you have any sense that you were in the um, kind of in, in the center of something really special? No, no. Yeah. We, we just knew. You have it now? You know, one thing, uh, <laughs> uh, well, it's always, you know, I, I guess I've been in a couple of really important movies, Stranger, Do the Right Thing, Platoon, and it's just, you know, you're so present, you're so bad doing that. You're not really reflecting upon what it could mean. You're just so happy that you're doing something that is so fulfilling in the moment that you don't, you're not reflecting upon it. And, uh, you know, I just, you do it and you move on to the next thing. And then it, it, it's a great satisfaction when it becomes successful. But, sure. you know, Maybe I was too naive to understand what to appreciate. No, I appreciate the actual act of doing it and working with these people and having fun doing it. But does anybody, if you're ever involved in anything historical, do you realize it's historical? It can't be historical when you're doing it. No. It's only, it's only later. Yeah, sure. But you can sometimes get a sense that, oh, this is a... This feels like I'm doing something that's special, really special. You know, I, I, I'm working with really, really outstanding people and the script is amazing. And it's it's also, you know, it's people are going to respond to this film. No, I'll tell you the truth. Three, I was, three, you know, I mean, probably, I was at the beginning. I was at the beginning of uh, working. I'm just expected everything to be that great. <laughs> Do, do it was only later that I realized that, no, that, that's not the way it is. Right. Yeah. Do you have any uh, uh, anything that you remember, I guess, since just to sort of uh, tie up the trifecta that we're talking about? I mean, do you have a, an Oliver Stone story or just some sort of feeling about working with, for him that, you, that stands out in your memory? Well, it, it's kind of a long story. Um, he was, he was, he, I think he was a bit of a sadist, to tell you the truth. I mean, he liked to make people nervous. He liked to put people on edge. And I think it was tactical in a way that he wanted that kind of edgy performance and to have people not quite sure what they're doing and what what um what's going to happen so he did do that i mean sorry i have I, it, it's too long uh and it was very very personal basically to make a long story short he um we had the scene as written and we rehearsed the scene and he didn't like not the way we did it. He didn't like the the scene as written. So we then improvised the scene. This is weeks before we actually did it. And he said, that's fine. And then once the time we got to do the scene, we did it the way we improvised it. And he hated that. And this is like my one major scene in the movie. And I was like, this guy won a Academy Award as a scriptwriter. He's bitching me and my other guy out for not writing a scene better than the one he had written. And I was just kind of, you know, just gave it up to the fate, to fate. You know, it's like, here I am, working, training, doing everything for five weeks. Here's my one big scene. And Oliver's being a bitch. And he's uh, blaming us for not coming up with a scene better than the one he had written. But the one we actually came up with worked out pretty good. And he kind of improvised it. He gave me one line. I improvised all the others. So. Well, we're, we're going to get you back, right, Nick, for the long version. Cause <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think we need all the long versions. But uh, that was pretty amazing. Um, by the way, I want to make a recommendation to you guys because I, I feel kind of a connection 
is it my imagination? This is this is kind of special. Um, I'm I'm kind of kidding, but I mean, I was really looking forward to this because um, a lot of the I I I've been doing this podcast so long, and this is kind of the thing that I really want to do with it. You know, and great, yeah, yeah, I mean... you know. So so I really appreciate your both trusting in it and agreeing to be part of it and doing it. So I've been listening to, and I'm winding down, I have one hour left of Ricky Lee Jones, her memoir, which came out a couple of years ago, her audio, she reads the audio book version. And I'm just going to tell you what, if you get the time to listen to this, download it, whatever, you can just down buy it or whatever. Uh, but it's it's so amazing and it's so Who? Whose book? Ricky Lee Jones. Oh, okay. I read her book. You read it, Last Chance, Texaco? Yeah, it's amazing. It is. And then I and then I met her. You did. Well, I'm the odd man out. I need to uh, catch up on my. No, yeah, it's great. Oh, yeah, but it all right. So, I I had to get some audio books. I and I'm typically a you know a reader, old fashioned reading the book, but. I, I thought this could be good. If she's doing it, I'll download it. So I got it and I'm listening to it. And it's a whole other experience, Richard, just because and I have no doubt that you had a very also strong reaction to it. And it's an, her story is, it's remarkable. I mean, Nick, you'll, you'll see, you know, but listening to her tell it is a whole other experience. Yeah. I mean, so I'm, I'm kind of really living it at the moment and experiencing it because I'm, I'm listening to it as I drive or, you know, like give, really giving it time. So I'm really I'm feeling it as an immersive experience. So I thought you'd both really get something out of it. So that's my personal recommendation. All right. I'm on it. Yeah. Yeah. Try, try, try to do that. And I'm curious to know what you will, you'll think, but yeah, you read it, Richard. I did read it a couple of years ago. I remember just reading it like in one, wow. one huge go. Yeah. Uh, very engaging. Um, I mean, that whole period, it, it, she's not a, I'm not a huge fan of her, but uh, it's the same way with, with, with Nick's movie. It, it was about Dennis Hopper. I, I'd never been a huge fan of, of, of Dennis's, but the way Nick yeah. told the story and recreated the vibe of Dennis's life made me reevaluate both him as a as an artist and as an actor. And it was the same thing. It was with um Ricky Lee Jones. It, it was like, oh okay, this is where she's coming from. And it's a real place and um and it's, and it's an amazing story. Yeah. Not I mean, that I remember yeah. much of it. But, uh, <laughs> well she's a, it's a, in that in the memoir she's a storyteller, whether yes. regardless of what you make of her music uh, or her voice, or what have you, but the, she's it's a story, so you can connect to it on that. Yeah, level, yeah. Obviously, yeah. she tells a very good story. Absolutely. As you can do through your photographs or through your, you know, Nick, your films or your your novel. Um, anyway, it was it was something I've been spending so much time listening to, so I thought I should share that. You know. To no other end. Uh, I'm gonna go out and pick it up. I, I I'm I, I think you've sold me on on um on getting something from Audible, which I've never done. So I'll I'll do the, uh, <laughs> you might I don't um I'll li I feel like I want to listen to it. I want to hear it. I yeah, hear it I, I since you haven't read it yet, I would recommend that. And um, but also I was not that I also don't have I don't have Audible. You can just download a one off. Mm -hmm. but I I didn't know I had this subscription apparently, and I, I so I was I was gonna I quit it, and when I did, I had these you know free credits that I needed to download. So I I thought, well, what do I? I don't know what I want, but I just I, I had like a nightmare. Um, I had a nightmare experience in that way where I had to um, cram on um, listening to Hunter S. Thompson, who's a writer I love. Yeah. Um, obviously, but um, I was there was one of his books that I hadn't read since probably i was a teenager and so i i'm not going to say which one because i don't want to i don't want people to 
to go and listen to how bad the the, the person who read the book w- was. But yeah. oh wow, it was so it was so painful um, to hear it when it's not read by the right person. And you know, knowing um, what a great character Hunter Thompson was. Fran Drescher reads Hunter Thompson. Yeah, exactly. It was that. It was that bad. Yeah, it was horrible. It was painful. But I I had to. I had to get an idea of a sense of the book. So I I was like jumping through, trying to get through that while I was in the car and then going back to the book at night. But uh, yeah, wow. Yeah, it's it, it'll tell you sometimes the power of the voice. Uh, yeah. Behind well, this is, you know? Hers is not, it's a bit of a jagged pill, her voice. Mm-hmm. She's got cool. like some septum oh. issue or something. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not necessarily for everybody, but her right. Her emotional performance in telling the story just got me, you know, grabbed me. And I've recommended it to, uh, you know, a, some friend of mine up here. And he's also, you know, was quite impressed by by the whole experience. Um, what was I going to say? Um, I don't know. Uh, anyway, what what do you guys, uh, What when's the next shoot? When's the next, you know? I think we're working on that now we're getting we just got a cut together and we've been um we've been uh talking to a certain programmer about it and uh okay. reception the reception has been pretty good so we're um thinking about uh now setting up some days to just tie up a couple okay loose ends and, and see what happens there and then we'll have a version that I think we're going to be happy with two things mm-hmm. now Richard also for you uh since uh, maybe even the last time I spoke, I'm now work doing work with the Woodstock Film Festival. So oh, interesting. So, okay, this could uh, be a place for so us. I'm happy that to, this this will play there if you guys wanted to. Uh, yes. And then, yeah, for sure. Let's make that happen. And two, where I'm is coming, this? what? Where? Where? Woodstock. Did you say? Woodstock, oh, Woodstock Festival, Festival, where you and I mm-hmm. actually, you know, spent some time. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> but um so yeah i mean i think this is a no-brainer and secondly i'm coming in, i'll be in la in mid-june january excuse me january for- well, then we'll have to get together and have lunch and uh yeah. and talk when you're in town please uh please reach out it'd you be will. great to catch up and I'll talk be, movies with you and a couple of days in the Bur- in burbank and then um in the desert for a couple of days too well if you're going to be in burbank then we have to go to bob's big boy where um where david lynch uh, wrote uh uh, what was it? Blue Velvet? Is that where he wrote Blue Velvet? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And, and Richard, <laughs> where, where are you? Where am I? I'm downtown. Oh, that's right. You did say just near the, uh, just near town, uh, the city hall and the, the police. It, it, it's phenomenal. Like bringing it back to Richard's book. Um, your yeah, zero. It's, zero. it's so many of the pictures are, are just shot within this incredible radius of Richard's place, um, which is very much ground zero. It's right in the yeah. What is it, the bank district? It's like the it's, it's like the it's, like, it's where everybody who needs to shoot New York, you know, oh, David yeah. Fincher needs to pretend he's in New York, or there's a commercial uh, for like Citibank. It's where all that happens, and um, and so like but three or four blocks of what looks like an urban environment exactly it's that leftover moment of los angeles from the 20s where they tried to where they tried to make it look like a metropolitan city and um so it it's richard examines so much of that area around him but in a way that um you know the film industry doesn't which is what's so interesting and if you're from los angeles i think that's another thing that strikes me is that you know um there aren't a you know Los Angeles street photography, as I have come to understand it, um, isn't like Richard's work, and, and I think that that perhaps comes from your living in New York. You know, you have an approach to LA street photography that is very sure. much like somebody from the East Coast, which are, makes it very unique. Um, and I think that's like for me as. I'm like a Angelino. I'm like a outsider Angelino in a sense, even though I'm a total insider. I guess you know, born and raised in LA. But I, I, I like. I've always gravitated towards work that is, of course, not your standard idea of what it's supposed to be. And I think that's really the magic of um, a year zero. 
Richard's book is that it, it has this totally different, very hold interesting up again, perspective. Richard. Richard, hold up the year zero again. Can you hold it up so people can see it? Well, both of us at the same time. Yeah, I'll go get mine too so we can yeah. get this level, level <laughs> trouble action. I'm the odd man out here, but I'm going to rectify that. So, if Richard, if I, I want a signed one though, I mean. What's that? You're gonna have to. I want a signed one, or maybe what I'll do. I could do maybe when I'm in LA, I'll buy it or something. And... Do that, or do you know Dashwood Books? Dashwood, New York, Dashwood, or uh, Dashwood, Karma. Two volumes. Karma book. Uh, wait till you get here. It's a. It's heavy though. It's four pounds. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna have to put it in your luggage and uh, yeah, get charged extra. Yeah, I know it's going to be extra because uh, we're we're flying with some cheap ass airlines. But anyway, uh, guys, part two. Nick, hey, can I, Nick? You were talking about L.A. street photographers. Yes. Um, who comes to mind? Does anyone? I know Gary Winogrand shot out here. He did some beautiful right. stuff. I know Bruce Davidson shot out here. He's a he's more of a New York guy. He has mm -hmm. one guy. I mean, Dennis Hopper shot some street stuff, but I think most of his really good stuff. I, think, is, I don't think you'd call him a street photographer. I don't think you would be called like you would. Who? You would think of Dennis as a street photographer, even though he shot street stuff. I don't think you would. No. You would put him in that category. But he had that kind of I, shoot from the hip aesthetic when he was shooting his, when he was shooting his friends kind of and Frank. Kind of thing, yeah, definitely. That's the end. Um, what's his name? There's one guy, uh, what Bill Stratford, Bill something, and he shot a lot of Hollywood, where where Hollywood, the film industry met Hollywood, the physical mm -hmm. place, and he's he's really good, but he's the only one that comes to mind. Um, other than the New York guys who came out here, who, who shot. You know what's a great book is the book they did uh, of the Misfits. You ever see that book? Seen that book, a, yeah, yeah. It's photograph, and they hired they they flew in Magnum photographers. Mm -hmm. I think one a week, and then they shot. They kind of documented the film. Great photograph photographers, uh, uh, and you know Magnum. Such and yeah, um, yeah, Dennis Stock, and they put the, the founder. Of Dennis it. Stock was the guy who did the okay. the other who, who who's an Angelino who did like the uh, Hollywood meets Hollywood. That's true. Concept. Yeah, such great locations in that film. Yeah, as you mentioned. Yeah, and that's a beautiful book. Right, yeah, wrote, somebody, somebody really good. Wrote the text. My, film, my film school is not starting to evade me. Let's see. What's that? Let's see. Who wrote The Misfits? No, no. I know this off the top of my head. wrote the text for the book, the photo essay. Oh, Arthur oh, Miller. For the book, or are you talking about the movie? Yeah, Arthur Miller who, wrote who, who, Arthur Miller right. wrote the script, right? That's right. I think he might have wrote, wrote the book, too. Wow. No, somebody else. Are you looking it up, Nick? I am, but... Uh, I don't know my glasses and some bootleg incorrect misfits is showing up some modern day not the not even the band hold on but i've got i've found it yeah it's obviously arthur miller directed john Huston, of course the book misfits book i don't own a copy of it but i've looked at it There's a lot of misfit, misfits discography, and misfit growing up awkward in the eighties. Misfits, yeah, I think we're losing uh, lost here. Misfits, a personal manifesto. <laughs> misfits, Glenn Danzig. Don't, Wait, know, would, don't get that joke. Misfits book, <laughs> uh, movie. Oh God. Yeah, I got to do some editing. Thanks, guys. Yeah, for sure. We look really lame right now, not <laughs> not being on top of this. <laughs> this is 
I'm not recording or anything. It's a... Yeah, please stop. <laughs> <laughs> this is pathetic. No, no, no. Anyway, the point is, is the text in the photo essay book of the Misfits is worth reading. It's, I think that's the point. Yeah, absolutely. So much to, I, I've learned so much. This has been a great, great, a great experience. And I will look forward to uh, part two, you know, when this is done. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we'll be back. We'll be at the Woodstock Film Festival we'll, and we'll all hang out together. We'll have to uh, cue you in on a, on a, when we have a cut and you should, uh, yeah. you should look at it. I'd love to. I really would. I think you're going to dig it. It's a very unique look. I have no uh, doubt. It's a Nick Evelyn. Thank you very much. And uh, Richard Edson, of course. Right. Yeah, no production. Um, do I get an EP uh, credit on it? If I... Absolutely. If you sell it and you, <laughs> and you <laughs> help us get there. I'll do whatever I can. Sure. All right. Adam, do you know do you know um Andy Schwartz? Andy Schwartz? Yeah, um, he was rocking rock rock back in seven or eight. Of, no, I, I don't know an Andy Schwartz. Oh, okay. I don't think. What 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 do you uh I thought you might he was a uh, publisher and editor of uh New York Rocker and then it was an A and R guy and he lives up near you up in Sargadies. Oh so, well that's that is very close. I'm just a little bit north of Sargadies, yeah. Good guy. Good guy. I was just staying with him in New York. He's got a place in the city. Oh okay. Yeah I'll look for I'll, I'll look out. I know several people. I know a bunch of people in Sargadies. And um, and then actually, the Woodstock Film Festival uses the Orpheum Theater, which is there. You know, they use that theater. That, what town are you in? I'm in Athens, which is just north of there. It's like you got right by Cats, across the river from Hudson, New York. Okay. Oh, so so by further Cats. north of Targeted? Yeah, so, just a little north of there. Yeah, by Cats. Oh, you know, love that area. Which is such love a great that. area. Talk about a great old, like, a real solid, like, a state city, a town. I mean, Catskill, great. I'm sure there's just, I'm sure there's lots of great stuff to shoot over there. That's a lot of Trumpers, though, huh? Yeah, well, it's getting more purple every day. Yeah. I, I, well, I have whatever, friends. If you're not in the city, you're going to be in it, you know. Right. Let's face it. But um, no, I mean, uh, uh, the town we're in is, I'm sure it's very purple. Nobody is obnoxious up here. That I will say. You don't see people That's a good thing. in the middle of the town in their, you know, truck with the flag, just you know, revving it at, at a liberal right, just with the truck at the supermarket. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen it. All right. Yeah. Um, well, we, we won't keep you uh, too much longer. We I have a okay. feeling you uh, have we run our time? Have we run our course here? Uh, what is it? Well, that's the beauty. Of it. There's no end to it, and okay. it's just a continuing work in progress. And you know, I mean it when I say I would love to. to and it doesn't have to be the podcast. We'll see if I, if we can figure out L.A. in January. That'd be great. We're gonna go. We'll get there on the. I think on the tenth. Well, yeah. Let let it let me know, and it would be great too if Richard came along too, and maybe uh, bring the book and let Adam yeah, take yeah. a look. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Let's make it happen. All right. We'll, we'll make sure it doesn't plan. before 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 our journey. It's a long story. <laughs> All right, man. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We'll move into part four soon. All right. Yeah. All right, Adam. All right, Adam. Be right. good. Nice, uh, Thank nice you so much. You again. Again. I'll send you the the podcast. Uh, the the you, you know you shouldn't listen to it all, but maybe you'll remember. Just kind of save us. Look out for us on that really terrible misfits like brain fade. If I know. I know. Help us. Don't worry about it. I I got your back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Adam. All right. Have a nice. Uh...